You need to know that before you were ever even created, that you would sin. He was already planning to die for you. And whatever you're carrying, press into Jesus. Amen. Guys, we're going to be in Matthew 19 today. So if you need a Bible, raise your hands or go there. We're jumping right into this. And as Pastor said, there's some pretty heavy text. What I mean by that is Matthew 19 is the story of Jesus coming as the king, bringing the kingdom. He's demonstrating to his people that God so loved the world that he gave his son. And we know all these amazing things about Jesus. He's loving, he's graceful, he's merciful. But how did he present this? The Bible says what will set you free? The truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And what we're going to unpack today is Jesus laying a foundation of truth for some Pharisees who don't understand God's plan for marriage. And by today's standard, I don't know that the world world definitely doesn't understand God's plan for marriage. But what does it mean for us to consider that truth and stand on a biblical marriage? I heard a story recently about a couple who'd been together for about three decades And suddenly the wife was sick, suddenly she was ill, and she passes away. And while they were taking that coffin through the funeral home, as they were turning the corner, they banged the coffin on the wall. The coffin opened up, and the wife got out, and she was good. They were together for another 10 years. Same disease shows up, same things happen. She passes away. And as they're going through the funeral home again, as they're carrying it, right as they're about to turn the corner, the husband says, hey, guys, Watch out for that wall, amen? (laughs) We're about to get into some... I had some of you for a minute there. You were like, wow, that's amazing. (laughs) But I have to say that because where we're going today, you're going to need to be lighthearted. Where we're going today, when I talk about marriage, you're saying, really, of all the days to go to church, can't we just praise and worship? I want to sit on my face, roll around on the floor. I want to cry and press into God. Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through, and I don't need to. God knows why you're here, amen? Some of you are excited and young and saying, I'm courting and I'm engaged. We're in the honeymoon period. We're married. Some of you are going through it and say, oh, I know what he's talking about. Some of you, it's collapsed. It's falling apart. And you're saying, God, help me literally. And I want to make you this promise. Regardless where you are, we are going to unpack God's word. And God is faithful. Regardless the mess of your life, we are Branches Church. Did you hear what Pastor Andrew said? We are here. This is about unpacking Matthew 19. We cannot cover everything, but Jesus is laying a foundation. We don't need you to carry guilt or shame of past decisions or whatever's going on, because in Christ, the Bible says, how many things are made new? All. And the word past in the Greek, all, that's all it all means. Amen? Norman Geisler for you. Let's read Matthew 19, you guys. And so Jesus did all these amazing things. He's had a good run. If you look at the Gospels, you'll see that most of his ministry is done in Galilee. And suddenly on this journey, he is crossing over. He's stretching them a bit, and you'll see what takes place. Matthew 19 and 1 says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And some Pharisees came to test him, and they asked Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he said, that the beginning the Creator made the male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh, for they no longer are two but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Heavy. And the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs born this way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live as eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Matthew 19 and 1, I want you to just receive this today. It says that he left the region where everyone was familiar. He was right there. He was before you, and he left to go across into Judea. But it says that those who followed him, they were healed. 
And while this is talking about spiritual and physical healing, you and I in Christ are spiritually healed. Amen? The old passes away, all things become new. He gives you the peace that surpasses understanding. And some of you here today are being stretched and facing some crazy stuff. And you're saying, I don't want to go down this road. But as you keep pressing into Jesus, there is life and there is beauty and there is healing flowing. Amen? He's doing all kinds of ministry. I know what it is like to go through crazy things in my life. Don't make your spouse or your marriage or the picture of your life the idol. It is about you and Jesus. And he's doing this amazing ministry. And of course, here we see in verse 3, Pharisees show up. The Bible says in verse 3, some Pharisees came to him to test him. And listen to their question. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? If you think about that, it's kind of a crazy question. Is it lawful to divorce her? Why are they so focused on divorce? Why have they cared about the people and the sheep? And you could say, pastoring them. Didn't they say, Rabbi, can you give us some teachings to help people in their marriages? They didn't say that. They were so caught up on divorce. They were so distracted by it because they wanted to test and trap him. You have to know that the region they're in as well is where John the Baptist preached. This is the reason where prior to this, Jesus' own cousin John was preaching. And why was John arrested? He was arrested for preaching about what? Marriage. He was preaching against Herod. And Herod's marrying his brother's wife. John was preaching this and soon his head would roll. How is that for a call of ministry? 20 years in the wilderness with God, John the Baptist, for a ministry that lasted only six months, but it was spirit-filled, and we are still talking about it today, amen? Maybe they were thinking, if Jesus says the same thing, likewise, he'll be captured, he'll be decapitated. But really what they're trying to do is test him and challenge him in this. You see, in that day and age, there was two ways of thinking. There was two rabbis, two schools of thought, two prominent teachers, and they're called, by the way, fishers of men. There was Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. Rabbi Shammai's teaching was way more conservative, way more rigid. It was that you don't get divorced unless there's adultery, unless there's infidelity, unless there's sexual immorality. But Hillel, Hillel's teaching was different. That's why when he asks about this, is it lawful, meaning is it in the law? Is the law full of this teaching that you can get divorced for any and every reason? And you might say, well, I'm listening to this guy preaching, but let me ask you the question. What are the grounds for divorce? What do you believe that is? In your own life, do you side with Shammai? Do you side with Hillel? Is it only of this infidelity or is it for any and every reason? And they're coming to Jesus and you're saying, well, pastor or branches, well, isn't it clear in the scriptures? Well, they're thinking of a verse in the Old Testament. They're thinking of the most famous place to hear about marriage in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 24. I'm going to read that for you. Don't go there for lack of time. It'll be on the screen. But their teaching is, in Huntington, Costa Mesa, Orange County, there's two trains of thought. Are you more conservative in this teaching or are you more liberal in this teaching on marriage? In Deuteronomy 24, this is the law of Moses. You might have professors who say, did Moses write this? There's many people that have PhDs disagree, but Jesus tells it's Moses. I'm going to stick with Jesus. Amen? Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. This is what they're asking of Moses back in the day. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing, or it might say in your translation, finds no favor, loses her favor to him because he finds something that's indecent or unclean about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her because she has been what? Defiled. It says right after, this would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. And you're saying, well, Brian, isn't that clear? Well, let me ask you, is it? What does it mean that she's displeasing or finds no favor to her husband? What does it mean that she's unclean and all of you are thinking things already? What does it mean that she's been defiled? Are you siding with Shammai? Is it only infidelity? Or are we siding with Hillel who says for any and every reason, well, pastor, you've got to give me a bit more than that. What exactly were they saying? 
Well, in that day and age, especially for the ladies to realize how far we have come, amen? In that day and age, Rabbi Hillel believed that if your wife bent the food, you could divorce her. Believe that she was too loud. If you watch the TV today and she was shouting and your team won and all the rest of it, you could divorce her, amen? Believe that if she was a brawler, you know, sorry, Ronda Rousey, Holly Holmes, Misha Tate, but you guys can't get married. They were believing that if she went outside without a head covered, especially what we wear to the beach today, any of us, believing that if you fought with your husband's parents, you could get divorced. And so how many of you technically, if Hillel was your pastor, could have got divorced already? Amen? I say this, and it's so serious, but the reality is even another rabbi said, if a man just simply finds another woman more attractive, write her some paper, hand it over, and they're good to go. How weak is this? How weak is this? That God ordains marriage and we're sitting in it and we're just putting away like it's nothing. I might fight harder on the mats at jiu-jitsu for a submission. I might work harder to get that wave. I might work harder to move the stock in my portfolio. But when it comes to this, I'm just going to give her a certificate of divorce and I'm out. They came to Jesus and they asked him the question, I love this, but what does Jesus do? He takes them back. They were asking Jesus a question from Deuteronomy 24, so he takes them back. And you know where he doesn't go? He doesn't go to Deuteronomy 24. He goes all the way back. He goes back to Genesis. Jesus goes right back to the beginning. Look what he says in verse 4. This will preach this bit right here. Haven't you read? That's it. Haven't you read what is written in the Word? He replied, at the beginning, the Creator made them what? Male and female. That is not a controversial statement. That is what God says. Haven't you read, he replied, that in the beginning, you who are doing ministry, you who are overseeing, you who are Pharisees with the books and the blogs and the new special revelation, haven't you read? He goes all the way back. He says in verse 5, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. They will become one. She will take your surname, Brian. You will wear a ring signifying unity. When the two come together for the first time, there is a shedding of blood. It is a covenant before God, and I hope we understand how miraculous this is. The greatest miracle in the Bible is when a sinner becomes a saint. Amen? Do you know what that means? It doesn't mean you just believe some preacher on a Sunday and believe the Bible and said, I'm a Christian. It means in your life, all of heaven was watching on the day you repented because the Bible says whenever one, that's you, sinner repents, what does heaven do? There's angels in heaven that you don't even know their name and when the day you confessed, they rejoiced. They should be praising God. That's all they're doing. And in the middle of that, what were they interrupted for? To see your life, see the blood that was shed abroad for your sins and God who raised Jesus from the dead. They celebrate. What a miracle. Children are a miracle. But what else is a miracle? A miracle is when God takes Brian and his wife and he makes them one. You can't do that. I can't do that. A miracle is when God sees you, an individual, and sees a female or a male, puts you together and makes you one. That whole account takes place in heaven. That isn't decided by a man, isn't decided by a judge, isn't decided by statements that we make. It's decided by God because God makes them what? One flesh. I say this to say as we realize this is going on, and you guys are saying this is getting pretty heavy right now, amen? Maybe we should lighten it up for a bit. What are you laughing at? Some of you guys said, oh, the early service wasn't even awake yet. So yes, let's lighten it up a bit. One of the people in this photo hasn't aged much, and the other one is me. This is in 1999. Some of you weren't even alive then. We are newly married in Vegas right there. We've been together for four months, and the whole team this week said, Brian, there's so many new people who don't even know your story. And our story, in a nutshell, is simple. We weren't raised in the church. We didn't know God. I came to America. We fell madly in love. And by love, I mean the world's love. I loved the way she looked, the way she made me feel, all the things she did for me. So I was loving who? Me. That's who she loved as well. We love the world's ways. And sometime after this, I mean, we had a son in 10 months or sometime literally after this, around this period, amen, we're pregnant. There's money in the bank. Life is going well. And within two or three years of a guy who would have walked out of the sim and had no clue about marriage, we were divorced. Came to America on top of the world, gaining the whole world, losing my soul. 
did not know Jesus, married and wanted it to work, but we were divorced. We were separated. And it sent me down a spiral to disprove the Bible, all the different religions, wanted to make sure there was no God. Why? Because if there's no God, it does not matter. If there's no God and you weren't created, if you're sitting here as an atheist or agnostic, I'll say it clearly, but we're just roadkill. My divorce doesn't matter. Politics don't matter. Whether you marry this or that, whatever you do with your day does not matter. I never knew the Bible. But finally, going into all these different faiths and challenging them, I came to faith in 2004. Amen? I witnessed to that woman three weeks later. She came to faith. Amen? And we are remade, and she's sitting outside in the back. Amen? Can we give it up for Jesus? My son is 21 and probably serving in the youth today, and he married a girl from this church. My daughter, Eden Avery, 14, is over there. My son, Jude Mike, is sitting outside, go and embarrass him, say hi, amen. Is God good? All the time, all the time, God's what? You remember that, amen. We can go old school. What I'm saying is what's amazing is God saved and redeemed us. And can I tell you that since we came to faith, we have not had one argument. I can wait. We haven't argued once. Life has been perfect. The kids go to sleep every day. We never fight. The bills stop showing up in 2004. I mean, there's a tree in our living room and money just sprouts off it. I don't get tapped out in, in jiu-jitsu, amen? I'm joking, but what I'm saying is no. We fight. We get into it at times. We struggle. We move forward. Why? Because what is a godly marriage? It's a picture of people that fight and put God first and keep returning to the plan again and again and again. The problem for us was we were focused on the divorce rather than the marriage like the Pharisees were. The problem was we didn't understand God's picture and Jesus bypasses their question and he goes back to the beginning and he begins to speak about it. See, my wife and I were looking for greener grass. We were looking for a way out. We were weighing out our options and saying, what is life really like? Did we make a decision? We didn't know what God said. And if you want to know what God says about divorce, you have to first know what God says about marriage. Amen. In verse 6, what did we read? Verse we went to back then. Jesus told me back then, told my wife back then, you are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has brought together, let no man what? Separate. And as God restored our marriage and we'd sit with friends at times, he'd say, man, what did God do? What were the verses? And that was it. Who God brought together, let no man separate. Yeah, but we think God missed it. We were raised in the church. We've grown apart. Dad's a pastor. Maybe I'm a pastor. I think we're good to go. I go back to this verse, who God brought together, let no man separate. No, 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 we know, Pastor, no, listen, don't separate. What I was saying is don't just say you're a Christian and tick the box. Are you his sheep and are you hearing his voice and do you want to follow him? Are you hearing his voice and what I mean by that, listen to me, wherever you are in your life, newly married, engaged, courting, single, your marriage is thriving or your marriage is falling apart. Maybe it's something you did. Maybe it's something they did. There is no shame in Christ. Amen. But here's the reality. Why did so many people want to get divorced? Marriage is hard. Marriage is hard. Can we just say that? Marriage is hard. Guys, in the back, we're going to have a load of books that I put out a few years ago, Never Fails Marriage, right? We call the book Never Fails, but I was going to call it Death by Marriage. And you laugh, right? But what is Christianity? Christianity is dying to self. Less of me, more of you. I must decrease, he must increase. I've had friends say, am I literally meant to die? Yes. Jesus died for his marriage. Jesus went to the cross for us. Less of me and more of you. I came not to be saved, but to what? You see, marriage is a graduation. I'm walking around by myself single with the whole world about me, a sinner, and God's working on me. And now I meet this lady, and God puts us together. you got two sinners together. He's going to use one another to bounce off each other, to die to self. Amen? Well, I want my house to be like this, my life to be like this, my finances to be like that, my, my being physical to be like this. Last time I checked, the Bible said, lean not on your understanding. Amen? Put on God's. Should marriages be good? Yes. Should there be romance and blessing and all the rest of it? Yes. But when they asked Billy Graham's wife, do you ever think about divorce and Billy? You know what she said? No, but I think about killing him every day. That's a real statement. While we're joking, here's the reality. Because it's a brutal thing in your life to go through what I went through. My life had worked out. It all makes sense. There's great money coming in, enjoying skateboarding around the world. And at that stage, I said, what? I was 19, naive, had no clue. 
We got advice from a lot of people. Oh, well, you're young and you don't understand and you'll meet someone else or go out and party and do whatever. If I was living in somewhere like Texas, I swear to you, and all the access to firearms and that, I wouldn't be alive today. I was depressed. I was stressed. I wanted out. I was over it. But see, when you look at what it says here, and though we're laughing about it, what's radical is statistics say in the last century, divorce is up 700%. There's less people getting married, but divorce is still up. 52, 53% of people in other states get divorced. You know what the, the rate is here in Orange County? 72%. Now I hear that and I say evangelism. We've got to reach people. Guys, there's resources. If you have a problem with marriage and you want help, this book is free. Pick it up. Read one page. That's it. Start today. Get involved in the church and the courses that are free. Don't say God isn't doing his part. Take this to heart and say, what is the word of God? Say, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That will minister to you. We were in that stage. It was all going on. But while we're hearing this, what was their point? Is what was going on with Moses. And Jesus was taking them back to the beginning. And in verse 7, listen to this. This is amazing. They come back to Jesus with this question. Can we get divorced for every reason? And what do they say? Why then, they asked Jesus, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? When you see that, what does that make you think? Does anything jump out to you? Why did Moses command? The first thing is they're focused on divorce, not marriage. The second thing is we just read Deuteronomy 24. Moses never, ever commanded this. When you read the Bible, you have to understand what is happening in the context. Why, Jesus? Because the Pharisees were misinterpreting and twisting the text. They were willing to just file divorces as it went for what? Oh, she bit your food? Good to go. That's it. And what does Jesus say, verse 8? Please hear how this would have been said in the Aramaic and Greek. This is radical. It's amazing. Jesus replied, Moses permitted. Your translation might say tolerated. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. He's saying, guys, this wasn't God's plan from Genesis. This wasn't what is best. Moses is regulating a bad thing because of the hardness of heart. And I can tell you, even if you're not married, all the issues you will have in your life are going to come back to your heart. Jesus didn't get up today as I woke up and looked up to God. And he said, here's Brian. I'm just going to tolerate him. He's not my kind of guy. I don't like this. I'm just going to tolerate him. He didn't cold shoulder me and keep me out in the distance. He looked at me and loved me with grace and mercy. All of your issues and struggles are going to come from a hardness of heart. And we're the body of Christ. So if the finger's damaged, the hip is damaged, the foot is damaged, as Pastor Andrew preached last week, we need unity in the body because even if Branches was the biggest church in the world with the most programs and we got every Afghanistan refugee saved or all the skaters and surfers, God says, if there's not love, there's what? A clanging symbol. You're not defined because you overcome your addictions. You're not defined by how well you preach or how many donuts. You're defined by your love for one another. What Jesus is saying is, guys, I'm going back to the beginning. You're missing it. You're focused on divorce or you're teaching and trapping me. But it's because of your hardness of heart. But here's the issue. If you were a Christian, do you have a hard heart? No. You were born again. Say it for the third time. All things passed away. All things became new. The prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 26 says, Of our coming to faith, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. You'll be done with your heart of stone. Whenever I default to this place of bitterness, issue, whatever, I am walking in a hardened heart. And why is this important? There's two kinds of relationships in this world, two kinds of marriages. There's contractual and there's covenantal. Contract says you do your part, I'll do mine. You fix the garage, I'll pay you. You mow the lawn, I'll pay you. You're loving, I'll be loving. You're kind, I'll be kind. You're bitter, I'll probably be bitter. You ignore me, I'll probably ignore you. That's what it's like, and that is not the Bible. The Bible is a covenant. Covenant says, regardless what you do, I'm going to walk in love anyway. Covenant says, regardless, even though I'm going through it right now, I'm going to stand. And covenant says things like, though we were all born into sin, I'm going to send a Savior. Covenant says things like, I will be your God. Amen, church, and you will be my people. Never will I leave you nor forsake you. Because I never wanted to get divorced. But under contract, that's what happened. Under contract, that's where our issues come in. Under contract, that's why you'll have beef with me and we'll have all these problems and we'll sit in that place. But no, the Bible doesn't teach this. I don't need to go in the Greek and the Hebrew, the words on love, because you already know where I'm going. 
What is the biblical picture of love? The what kind of love? The agape. The sacrificial love you hear about in Corinthians, you hear about in Romans. Verses like this, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love, agape for you. While we were all still sinners, what did Christ do? Died for us. Amen. Preach it. He died for us. That is enough for today. That's all. If you need to understand something good about your life, Christ died for you. I get remarried. Okay, God, what's the plan? He says it in John 13, 34. A new command. Okay, Lord, what's the command? A new command I give to you. Agape one another as I have agape you. I didn't love my wife that way. I loved her unconditionally as long as she kept my what? Conditions. I loved her unconditionally as long as she kept my conditions. But that's not love. God looks at you today and we love this. Oh God, I had a crazy last night. I got in a fight. Or on the way to church, all sorts is going on. But you're so gracious and loving and kind and you love me. I'm good to go. But do I extend that to my spouse? Do I extend that to you? Do I expend, ex extend that even to myself? Because I believe some of us here and just the broken relationships in our life and our marriage is because of the false things we're preaching to ourselves. All Satan said was, did God really say? He didn't even tell her what to do. He just said, did God say? Then he lied to her. She could have said, I know what is written, just as Jesus said, it is written. Amen. Some of us are sitting here saying, well, if my spouse was just like they used to be, if it was how it used to be, if things were like that, or if they were more like this person, I could love them. That's all contract. That's not covenant. Jesus said, at the what? Beginning. You guys know Genesis, but I'm going to summarize it for a sec. The Bible says in Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth. Let's wake up. Amen. He created the heavens and the earth, and he saw that it was. You have to get this. It is all good. Every single thing is perfect all the time. But in Genesis 2.18, God says there's only one thing that's not good, and what is it? That man is. Do you know he said that before there was a curse? You know he said that before Satan showed up? Think about the fact that Satan never even showed up till they were married. He couldn't get between God and Adam because they were close, but as soon as the woman showed up, he came in for division. Your biggest battles are going to be in your house. Your wife's going to say things to you that no man ever will, and you might say things to her that you would smack someone senseless if they said it to your own mother. Amen? This is real life. This is some preaching right here. He made it. He saw that it was good. None of the animals killed him. No one dropped dead. There was no sin. But guys, there's one thing that's not good. What is it, God? Man is alone, but he wasn't alone. He was with God. Every question he, had, he asked, the answer was only godly advice. Sounds too good to be true. Amen. I'd be content, but no. God was making Adam, knowing all the time that there would be a lack without someone else. Not a lack because of God, because he was fulfilled, but that was his plan. And so what did God do? God said, Brian, get out of the way. And the Bible says he made Adam fall into what? Asleep. The Hebrew word is trance. He got man out of the way. And he took from the man's what? Cell structure. The woman was already part of him. But he took from the man the cell structure, who he was, and he created the woman. And Adam woke up and what did he say? Whoa, man, cheesy pastor joke. Amen. <laughs> and then what did she do? She came alongside of him, put his arm around her. He covered her. He led. She was alongside of him. How many women did God bring to Adam? How many? One. No backup plan. There was no Lilith. That's a myth. There was no some other woman. There was no God like, I'm going to do this thing. If it doesn't work out, this is it. It was Eve. And Eve was the object of beauty. Whatever color her hair was, however her body changed, whether he was going whatever, and his teeth were falling out, all the rest of it, that is the standard of beauty. That is what God did. And why do I love this picture so much? Because we did a marriage thing here a few years ago, prior to 2020. And the statistics were that for millennials, by the time they hit 2020, with the flipping cars and flipping jobs and flipping situations, that they projected that by the time they're married, by the time they have a kid or a house, they're going to be so easy to just walk out of that marriage that 80% of those marriages would fall apart. And can I tell you, we see it. We see it. Can I give you guys some advice that I think is wisdom? Find some of the older people in this church. Ask to meet with them for lunch. Write down five or six questions about marriage and go and ask them how they did it. Go and ask them, what did you do when he drove you crazy? Like Billy Graham's wife said. What did you do when this happened? That happened. Go get some wisdom because the world has us distracted by everything else. But I'll tell you this. 
When your marriage falls apart, where you live changes, how much you see your kids changes, who you're physical with changes, and your faith can even change. And I'm being radical because when you see the text, this is what Jesus lands on in a second. I was at Danny Bradley this past week. I mean, our church, the Bradleys and the Snooks, they have a whole teaching, re-engage a marriage course. And while we're just at jiu-jitsu, Danny just says, oh yeah, last night was great. We had this whole teaching on grace. Do you realize when you first met your spouse how much grace there was? I do. When I was pursuing my wife and she worked at Mother's and I got those black bean burritos for five bucks, but tipped like 50, 15, amen. There was so much grace. Where I put my shoes didn't matter. If she burnt the food, which back then most vegan food wasn't as good as it is today, so it kind of may as well have been burnt anyway. <laughs> Let's be realistic here. All the soy I was eating to fall in love with this woman. You don't fight. You don't fight over toilet roll. You don't fight if the seat is up. You don't fight all over the issues. Let me just say it. The grace was always there, but you're kind of living in la-la land. Why? Because once finances come in, once kids come in, once your boss chews you out, once life is hard, you've got to come down to the real world. And too many of us say, oh, the picket fence is shaking. No, you're just landing on level ground. You're just getting to where you need to be in all of this stuff. Because guys, think about the word marriage. Marriage is just a title, marriage. But what is a marriage? It's a relation, what? Ship. What do you do in a relationship? You relate. So when I pursued my wife, it was all about her. It was all good. And it should still be. But as we begin to fight these issues and struggles, now we're relating in the chaos. One of my kids came to me and said, Dad, I'm done. I say, we need to put the gloves on, get before God. You need to start relating in the things God is talking about. And some of you are sitting here and you're saying, well, Pastor, this is crazy. I mean, some of you guys, this is shocking, right? That I'm preaching good because you know what it says in verse 10? Listen to this. Jesus has just said all of this stuff and the disciples are as freaked out as you are. It says in verse 10, the disciples said to Jesus, meekly, you could say, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. What he's saying is, do you realize the commitment? Does she look good? Is he just handsome? Is he just someone who strolled in and out of the church? Or do you get what's going on? Do you realize, Brian, that when you came to faith, you were picking up a cross and Leonard Ravenhill or Tozer, one of them used to say, you knew a thing about a man of God because when he picked up his cross, he never came back. He was going to that hill to die on. When we came to faith and got married, is it the I do and that's it? We're going to finish the race. And listen, I know crazy things might have happened. She did this, he did that. I'm not here to bash people. God hates that we get divorced because it hurts us, but he doesn't hate those who've been divorced. He loves you. His grace and mercy is there. Walk in that. Do not miss what the word is saying. Amen. They followed him. That's not what I'm saying. But the reality in all of this is we look at it. When I first came to faith, I remember C.S. Lewis's book. I read everything I could by him. Old English theologian, you would say. Some agree with him, some don't. Very famous. But what he said was, when we go to an altar to get married and we say, I do, who are we deceiving? If we're at a service right now, am I deceiving you, my family and friends? Am I deceiving the minister? Am I deceiving my spouse? Am I deceiving myself? Am I deceiving God? And I'm not saying that to say, man, life is that crazy. It is. But what he's saying is, Jesus is literally telling these single people, do you get the cost? You're committed to this. You're going to fight for this. You're willing to die for it. He goes on, he says this in verse 11. Jesus replied, and some of you might be thinking this right now. Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. Meaning some are called to marry, some are going to remain single because they're not going to be that committed. And he says in verse 12, radical, there will be eunuchs who were born this way, meaning they won't procreate, they won't want to be sleeping around, they won't be doing these things, they're going to refrain from it. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, meaning those like Daniel, who many believe was a eunuch, who overseen the king's duties and overseen the women in the house, who were the kings. He couldn't go being physical with them, sowing seeds everywhere. He was made a eunuch, so he couldn't do that. And then he says this, but then there are those who choose to live like eunuchs. Why? For the sake of the kingdom of God. If the kingdom of God, if the kingdom of heaven is not central, none of this really matters. How do you get through those hard seasons? Because it's about God. 
How do you learn to walk in grace and mercy? Because it's about God. And I'm telling you, though you're young and you wrestle, you might have been through a marriage and now you're remarried. Well, hey, let's focus on God in this. We can't go into all these details when I'm called to preach Matthew 19. This isn't only about marriage. Give me grace in that. Amen. But he's saying this. Thank you. I received that. But he's saying this. If you want to know more, read 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35, because what he tells the church there is, for those who are single, wage war for the kingdom. But he says, for those of you who are married, your focus will be on God and then your spouse. My marriage is God, then my wife, then my kids. All of that comes under ministry, then it's outward to other people. If any of those things are in order, things are going to be off balance. If I get my love or satisfaction out of my kids over my spouse, I heard a guy preaching years ago, and I would never do this, but he's saying, if you were in a river and the boat went down with my wife and my kids, I should save my wife first. And his point was, when I get before God, the first person I'm going to give an account for is my wife. My kids will eventually leave and go off and be cleft together with someone else or remain single. Amen. You say, Brian, how do you live this way? 1 Corinthians 7, 7. The apostle Paul wrote 13, maybe 14 of the books in the New Testament. He maybe had a wife, historians say, but he was single when he encountered Jesus. And he says this radical. I wish that all of you were as I am. How was Paul? But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, one has another. I was at a Calvary Chapel event a few weeks ago, and I met a guy about 65-ish. Together guy, musician, never been married, completely content. That's not me. I wanted to get married. You might be in here and say, hey, I want to remain single, I know. If you're not married, God says you should live as though you're single, though. I could walk down that road right now, and as a man, I need to say that to some of the men or women in here, because i got a 14-year-old daughter, and I want us to be able to honor what marriage is, even when people go through divorce or singleness. Amen? Paul's saying, I wish you were single like me, but don't forget Paul was going to Rome to be killed. You, if you have the gift of singleness, you probably know it. But that means don't just sit here saying, where's the husband? How quick can I get married? All the other people are doing it. No. Lord, what is my gift? God, bring me someone to bless me. No, 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 Lord, make me a blessing to someone. Make me a blessing so when we are engaged, we're not going to tear each other's heads off because we did because we missed it. So if you were up here preaching like I am, some of you are shocked, where would you go, amen? Should I put the photo up there again and have a bit of a laugh? <laughs> where would you go? Guys, I don't want you to think of branches as a church you go to. When I sit with Teach Team, when I sit with Pastor Andrew or whoever, the heart of this church is that we are a body. We don't have an official church membership, but you should be able to say today, wherever I am, a book might help me. Sitting with couples might I'll tell you, there's couples in this church who have faced some crazy stuff. And if I message them, they would gladly sit with you for months to help you whatever you're going through. Married, single, divorced, whatever. But I want to say this, that when we started today, where did we focus? That Jesus made his way out of town. He went on a different route. Yet the people followed him and they were what? Healed. Maybe God is stretching you right now and you're saying, Pastor, you have no idea what I'm going through. I remember the feelings of paranoia, of neuroticism, of not wanting to live because what was familiar to me, the kingdom I was making, and those things are of God. But I couldn't imagine it. But I'll tell you, Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, he is more than your marriage, more than whatever's going on. Maybe you made the mistake, maybe someone else, whatever it is, but he says, following him, there'll be healing. And what did he say last? This is for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. See, the reason my marriage can fail is not my view of marriage, but my view of who? God. The reason I would wrestle as a single person is not my view of being single. It's my view of God. And I started by challenging you with something you said. Really, though? I said the Bible is the story of marriage. Genesis begins with one. Revelation ends with one. What does the Apostle Paul say in Ephesians 5? He says this in 531. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Did Jesus leave anywhere to be united to his wife? He got out of heaven and he came to the earth. He lived and died a perfect life for your sins and mine so we can freely receive that gift, nothing we've got to do. He was willing to die for his marriage. You say, whoa, pastor, you're stretching it. Well, no, because in verse 32 of that verse, he says, this is a profound mystery but I'm talking about Christ in the church. I'm talking about what God did. Guys, we are living in a crazy world. 
Israel never had to be exiled, but they were missing it on things. You're going to blow it at times, but should my marriage be getting more godly? If my wife suddenly ran off and did crazy things, I don't have a choice to that. I'm going to stay focused on the Lord. I'm following all the more. I need help, love, grace, and mercy. Amen? Where do we go with this? Well, guys, we're all in this room, and you, like I said, might be on the mountain. You could be in the valley. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Guys, the most important marriage there ever will be is between believers and Christ Almighty in heaven in Revelation 21 and 22. Maybe you're here today and you're just saying, man, this, this, this has messed my mind up. I just came in here early morning and suddenly I'm hearing about sin and catastrophe and craziness. But I'll tell you guys, many of these other supposed gods, when they died, all we have is a grave. But Christ isn't in the grave. Christ isn't in the ground. The Bible actually says, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and yours, if your faith is in him, is in heaven today, seated beside the throne of God, and the Holy Spirit is who's in our midst today. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came into the world to convict us of our sins. So maybe you're just hearing you say, man, I get God's grace, love, and mercy. I get that I'm that bride who's wrestling and struggling, and I need forgiveness. We can pray for that in a moment. Maybe you're here and you're singing this and I don't even know my identity. Do I have this gift or that gift? Maybe there's ways I've lived in relationships. I want to give that all to God and make a stance today. Maybe you're here and you just say, man, I'm newly married. I need all the help I can get. I want to pray for that. Maybe you're here and you said, it has been a train wreck like my life has been. And even now we press in because we need all the things God has for us. Wherever you are in this, I don't need you to stand today. I need you to do certain things today. This is very personal to you, but I'm going to pray for us for about a minute or so. And then when we stand and praise, if you need prayer for anything, it can be things we didn't even talk about. There'll be people around this room and they love you and they care for you and they want to pray for you. They want to help you. They want to encourage you. Let's just come to the Lord today with humble hearts. Let's just come to the Lord today and say, Lord, I'm going to stand on your truth. I'm not going to misinterpret, misunderstand. There's no shame here. And I want you to know as a preacher, I am preaching to the church. People had scenarios even after the first service. Well, what about this and that? I have a responsibility to preach what Matthew 19 says. And we live by the word. God, I pray for your church today, for your bride. That Lord, if anyone is lost, does not know you, that today they could confess you as Lord, put their faith in you. They could come up to me or to a friend afterwards out eating or even to someone at the side and say, I know how I've lived. God is speaking to me. I need to be born again. That's called repentance. Maybe you're here today and you just say, all these other things are floating around. I need someone to sit and intercede and believe because it hurts. God, we're going to praise you. We're going to worship you. And you are present in this room. And Holy Spirit, I pray. Speak to us and comfort us, lead us. Lord, we give you glory for the cross, for the blood, for the yes and amen that is you. Let's worship him and receive prayer, church. Amen. Well, church, you need to hear me pastorally on this. Do not leave here with shame or condemnation because we... It's like our sin nature. We want it to be so perfect. And when the Bible says be holy or be perfect, it's talking about being bent towards God. You cannot do everything right. Don't leave here saying, well, our past marriage was like this or our life was like that. I would love to have spent three hours unpacking all those things, what that means. I was speaking recently at a church in Arizona and a lady that was in her 60s was driving from under the church and apparently the radio was playing me preaching on marriage. And so she called her ex-husband, lived an hour away. And they came to the night service and said, we believe we got divorced and it wasn't on God's territory. It wasn't what he had. They had five kids, almost 65, and they got remarried just this last month. Amen. But here's the reality. These things don't always work out. If I hadn't been remarried, God is still good. What's more powerful than our guilt, our shame, our pains and hurts? You answer that. What's more powerful? The blood of Jesus. He loves us. He cares for us. Get a book. Get involved. Sit with people. There's people who will love you and help you. We want to be a strong community to help that 72%. Amen. Let's extend our hands. God, I pray your favor on your people. I pray where they want to condemn themselves. There's no condemnation in you, Romans 8.1. And Lord, that they would see, I get to be a man who represents you, a woman who represents you, a youth who represents you. 
I pray for favor, God, and strength in the spirit as they walk out of here single. I pray for their marriages, God, that you give them the confidence to trust at times when you feel like giving up when the grass is so much greener. I pray that, God, where they just say, well, this is it for me. No, it's not. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are your workmanship and every day the grace and mercy is renewed for what you have for us, God, that they would walk so closely with you. It's been said the Holy Spirit is the most ignored person in the church, but Lord, Holy Spirit, lead your people. Lead them this week. Grace and mercy, church. And you agree with this, in Jesus' name we say, amen. God bless you. Well, guys, I hope that encouraged you. Please hear me. I am preaching through Matthew 19, so I couldn't stop on everything. I couldn't unpack this or unpack that, and it led to many questions. Afterwards, I gave away my book, Never Fails, at the end of service. That's for sale on Amazon and other different places. But the goal was to encourage our church to say, where are we in our marriage? Are we in a bad place? Have I been divorced even? Am I single? Do I understand this? And to push them into the body all the more and say, how do we help you? For those of you listening, I'm going to be following up with an episode this upcoming week with some good friends of mine in their 50s who've been married for many years, raised four kids. My son, Dakota, married into that family. So we're going to take that sermon on the tail end. We're going to answer a load of questions. What is it like when you go fight? What is it like when you go through this? What is it like when this happens in your life? What are the biblical things that you stand on? And what do you want this generation to hear about marriage? So... Stay tuned, stick around, please share, follow all of that stuff that I never thought I cared about, but I want people to hear the gospel, hear about things that will encourage them. So remember, the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. God bless you all. Amen. Mm -hmm.